about to begin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, apologize for the last, but well, actually a spectacular storm last night. Uh, heat lightning, it's glorious. Um, as a, as a politi politicians and entertainers know that uh, when you get to be the third person doing an act, you've got to figure out some gimmick or prop to do it, do it differently. So following uh, uh, the effervescent Corby and the uh, joyous Julia, it's hard for me to figure out a niche. So what I've done today is uh, Since this is an aperitif session, this is our last morning, the third day. Some of us may be logy. Seems to me it's appropriate for any of the old timers who really want an aperitif. Whether it's, I've brought some from home and feel free. Feel free, just, just come up anytime. Now, the one person we know never needs an aperitif is Ben Rosen, uh, effervescent forever. Um, so let's start this morning. Let me, ben asked me to, to remind people that the sessions are all being videoed. So if there's anything you missed that you uh, felt uh, bad about it, particularly one of my sessions, you can go, go home and, and uh, watch, it, watch it tonight or go rewatch re it as I will many, many times over the year. Uh, so we begin this morning with, with uh, uh, we're going to talk, as you know, about each, each of the, the sessions, give you a chance to choose what you want to see and what you want to watch on video. Uh, the first one is on Design of Babies, Future Families, Biological Truths, and Legal Fictions. Alta Charo, who is the prof a professor of law and bioethics at the University of Wisconsin. Alta. So in 2013, a young girl named Jahai McMath died in California after having had what was actually supposed to be a fairly routine, although somewhat complicated surgery having to do with her tonsils so that she could sleep better at night. So 2013, she dies in Oakland Children's Hospital. In 2018, she died in New Jersey. And that might sound surprising to you because that would mean that from 2013 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, she was dead in California and alive in New Jersey. So the question I've got for you is, is that insane? Is that even possible? And the answer is found in the question of whether or not we need to have biology define us completely. Does it have to define whether we're dead or alive? whether we're male or female, mother or father, uh, does it have to be how it is that we quote unquote design our children? Because in the session that I'll be having with Sean Carroll, I'd like to talk about ways in which we can distinguish between those things that are biological truths and those things that are the legal fictions that we use when biology doesn't give us the answers that we need in order to organize our lives. Fabulous, put some time in the bank there. Uh, Robert Lang is a physicist who's one of the foremost origami artists and theorists in the world. I'm excited about this one, having kids, well, and I can't do it. So he's gonna talk to us about origami, the art and science from a master. So physics and origami, Japanese paper folding art, don't seem to go together. But starting in the mid 1990s, a group of origami artists, mathematicians, physicists, and people everywhere on the spectrum started applying math that revolutionized the world of origami art. And what they developed had spillover effects, realizing engineering devices based on folding that apply from space to medicine to inside your body. In this talk, I'm going to show some pretty cool origami art photos, show some pretty interesting origami engineering applications, and I hope I'll see you there. Chris Hill is one of America's most distinguished ambassadors. Uh, he only managed to, to do four posts in Iraq, South Korea, Poland, and Macedonia, now based at the University of Denver, a frequent a speaker here and also on television. Uh, we're always delighted to have Chris and Julia back, so please, Chris. Ambassador. 
Thank you very much, Jay. You know, after um, two days of sort of doom and gloom about the Trump administration, I thought I would perhaps lighten the mood by talk about, talking about North Korea's undeterred effort to <laughs> destroy us with nuclear weapons. Uh, indeed, it's been kind of an interesting year. Uh, you know, we started off with, uh, at the end of last year, you recall, it was, uh, it looked pretty uh, tense there. You know, Americans who were contemplating how to survive their relatives during Christmas uh, holiday were instead thinking about how to survive a nuclear attack by the North Koreans. And then about a week later, of course, uh, we had uh, uh, the leader of North Korea, proposing to be friendly with South Korea, and indeed that's a process that has continued. You may have seen the news in the last day or so about uh, North Korea and South Korea having a joint team for the Asian Games. But he also proposed having a meeting with our president, and so that took up pretty much most of the uh, spring as they got ready to uh, go to Singapore. And uh, from the point of view of a career diplomat, where you try to prepare everything so that uh, you never have to sort of have any questions about how a meeting comes out because it's already been preordained before the meeting starts. I mean, we just expected the two leaders to talk about each other's haircuts or something. Instead, uh, instead they were kind of uh, playing tennis without a net to mix the metaphor. And uh, the consequence is that uh, we're not really sure where we are and where this is going. But my own view, and I will try to impress upon my panel this view and upon you, is the need to really deal with this problem and ensure that we have a situation where North Korea does not uh, retain their nuclear weapons, because to do otherwise, I think, is to create a lot of problems. So uh, we look forward to a really, uh, really good panel, and um, I hope you all can come. So the haircuts line is the best one of the morning so far, C coming from a diplomat, no less. Uh, my old friend John Donovan, who's been a regular moderator here at Kent Presents, uh, a newscaster for ABC News, host and moderator for Intelligence Squared Debates. This morning we'll talk about, we'll lead a panel on a different key, the story of autism. John. Thank you. And uh, Jay, I see you still have the cane over there, but I just want to let you know, crutch beats cane. <laughs> I have a question in terms of autism I'd just like to ask all of you first. Who here, show of hands please, has ever heard of autism? Oh, the, the, a, 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 a guffaw from the front. How could we not have heard of autism? If I had asked that question 25 years ago, very many people would have said, what's autism? Maybe they had seen the movie Rain Man. We forget what we forget, but 25 years ago, autism did not have the recognition or the profile that it has today. My co-author on the book that we wrote, Karen Zucker, who's here and will be speaking with me, and I spent seven years digging out the history of this condition. And one of the things we did was to go back to the, its origins. And by origins, I don't mean what causes autism, because I'll tell you now, we do not know. We do not know what causes autism. But how did we become aware of it? And we wanted to know who was the first child ever diagnosed with autism. And we dug out that story. And there's a great deal of detective work uh, involved in tracking down somebody whose name appears briefly in the medical literature. And we're going to share that story. But not only are we going to share that story, we're going to share the story of what happened when we discovered that that story, what that story had to tell us. And if you um, have a loved one who has autism, who's on the spectrum, if you're on the spectrum yourself, if you have grandchildren, if you have children, if you have friends or neighbors, I want to tell you that there's hope in the story that we discovered about that first child's life. Hope about the ability of society to do the thing that it needs to do, which is to learn to accept people who are different by virtue of their neurological wiring. There's been a great deal of bigotry and prejudice, but a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it has been gradually overcome through the work of an unseen civil rights movement. So that's our presentation. And there's going to be a little bit of a surprise that I will hold back on uh, as part of our presentation, but we would be delighted to see you there. Thank you very much. You know, the, the genius of Ben and Donna is that in the morning, 
albeit almost a rainy morning, we can go from design of babies and origami to autism and Bitcoin, whatever the hell that is. So we're, we're going to find out, I guess. Um, and uh, so Bitcoin, blockchain, and cyber currency. Neha Narula is the director of digital currency initiatives at the MIT Media Lab. Good morning, everyone. So uh, money. Money runs the world. We choose where to study, what to do, where to live, in part based on how much money we think we might make. Now, initially, money was very concrete. It was stones. It was coins, beads, shells. Then money became digital, ones and zeros, electronic payments. Now, with the advent of cryptocurrencies and blockchains, we've figured out how to create money without any governments, banks, or other institutions in the middle. So is this good? Is this bad? Uh, in our panel, we will debate the merits of this technology. We'll explain exactly what it is. And if you have questions, just come find me afterwards. I promise you'll understand it. And we might even show you how to actually make your own money out of thin air. Thank you. Is Echo here? What? Uh, wrongful convictions in the post DNA era. Pinch hitting for Echo Yanka. Hi. Here Good morning. My name is Nina Morris, and I'm a lawyer with a group called the Innocence Project in New York. And picking up on Ambassador Hill's theme of lightening the mood, I'm going to talk to you uh, this morning in our panel about the criminal justice system's equivalent of a nuclear disaster, which is innocent people going to prison and sometimes even to death row for crimes that they didn't commit. But it's not all bad news. Thanks to DNA science, uh, the hard work of many lawyers in the system, and many conscientious prosecutors and police officers, officers who are determined to get to the bottom of all of these wrongful convictions. We are seeing innocent people freed from prison and death row in record numbers, uh, and we're working cooperatively to understand the reasons how they got there and how our system can so often get it so badly wrong. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the work that the Innocence Project is doing to hold people in law enforcement, especially prosecutors, accountable in the minority of cases where there is intentional misconduct that leads to a wrongful conviction, uh, and in some cases cases perpetuates it, where prosecutors continue to hide evidence of a person's innocence or resist efforts to make it right when a, a case is uncovered. Um, but the real highlight of the panel is going to be uh, my friend and client, Robert Jones, who was exonerated in 2017 after serving more than 23 years in Angola prison in Louisiana for a rape and murder he didn't commit, um, thanks to the hard work of lawyers in New Orleans and some help from our office. Uh, and you're going to hear from Robert directly about his ordeal and how he survived it, and it's an incredibly inspirational story, so I hope we'll see you there. Thank you, Nina. More than able pinch hitter, and, and if I get in trouble, I want you defending me. And uh, uh, the Innocence Project, uh, if you don't know, it is one of the great American institutions uh, doing, doing the Lord's work for all of us. And so, so uh, I commend Nina and, and Barry, who, who's created it, an old friend. And now my dear friend Kurt Anderson, uh, writer, host, and co-creator of, of the extraordinary uh, NPR show Studio 360, talking about how we got to post-truth America, uh, uh, which will be fascinating, historically uh, uh, shocking, and uh, always will have some taint of humor as we talk about the Trump age. Thank you, Jay. Um, post-truth, it's a phrase along with post-fact and alternative facts that we've only uh, come to learn in the last couple of years. But uh, the point of my talk today and the book on which it's based is that it's been a long time coming. It did not begin uh, with Donald Trump, although every day, practically, we have evidence of it. For instance, when Rudy Giuliani this week said on CNN, no, when he was, when it was, when the anchor said, facts are not in the eye of the beholder, Rudy Giuliani actually said, no, these days facts are in the eye of the beholder. Um, but as I say, America's iffy grip on reality did not begin two years ago or five years ago. 
The internet had a big role, but it did not begin with the internet. I'll talk about that. When I was working on my last novel, which was which is set in the 1960s, and especially the late 60s, I realized that among the other things and the unreckoned things that happened in the 1960s was the birth of, of uh, or the or the reinforcement of a, of, a, of, of the post-truth present, but it didn't begin there. Uh, it began way earlier with a whole set of attitudes and traits that define America for better for a long time, but as we see now, as well as for worse. Uh, as I, uh, this, this, this book, this, this project of mine, thinking about this and putting this all together, by the way, I, I just want to make clear, it didn't begin when Donald Trump came on the scene. I, 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 I was uh, conceiving, I had conceived of, researched, and, and mostly written the book, mostly finished the book before our president was ever nominated. So he was just, he's, he's the silver, or, or rather, for me, there is the silver lining of Donald Trump, which is that he appeared and became the poster boy for this theory I've been working on for years. So uh, I hope to see you later. Thank you very much. Now, there's a lucky man, after all. What relevance would that book have of Hillary was president? I don't know. But, uh, so so uh, shameless plug time. Uh, Kurt's, Kurt's book, Fantasyland, which is fantastic. It's on sale out there. I noticed not everybody bought copies of, of uh, Mitch Landrews and Charles Blow's book. I'm, I'm going to inspect your bags when you leave today. So please go out and uh, support our speakers. It's important that their books uh, move. Uh, Jerry Saltz is not only the senior art critic of New York Magazine, but we're here to celebrate the fact that he's just won the Pulitzer Prize for criticism for 2018. Jerry is going to speak about the contemporary world, the good, the bad, the very bad, tips, lessons, and warnings. Uh, my panel will be kind of the opposite of Kurt Anderson's in a way. He's got post-truth. I'm from the art world, a specimen from the belly of the beast, I'm afraid, of uh, many truths. No truths. You have your truth. You've got your Hamlet. You've got your Hamlet. And they're all the same, but different. People understand TV. They understand movies. They understand the Kardashians. Um, people now understand money. But people get defensive and pissed and cynical about art. I do too. I too hate it. I too know that about 85% of what I see, and I think I'm being generous, is not so good. However, however, art is not about understanding. And that's what we have to keep in mind. We have to stay open. In my talk, I may bring free food, incidentally, uh, so, you know, you'll be high on sugar for the, fr you know, I'm annoying, I know. Uh, uh, my talk will be about staying open, uh, staying on your toes, thinking for yourself, and not asking what does it mean, not asking how do we understand art, because you don't really ask I don't understand Mozart. You don't say, I don't know what Mozart means. So I hope you leave my talk high and also open to art, never cynical. Thank you. Uh, my dear friend Faye Waddleton, who I'm happy to have back. Um, has a bio which lists a lot of firsts, but rather than cite the first, the only thing to say is that Faye is extraordinary at whatever she has done and does, uh, particularly as president of Planned Parenthood, where she represented all of us in the country with such distinction. She will talk today about, with a panel, about sexual harassment and the assault in the era of the hashtag MeToo movement. Faye?
Well, it'll be a, quite a change from the one that you heard uh, just prior to this. Um, in 1980, the um, Civil Rights Act was amended with the Equal Employment Opportunity uh, Commission created under the 1964 Civil Rights Move, uh, the Act of, of Civil Rights Act. So sexual harassment and sexual assault has been around and of concern for a long time. In 1999, the Center for the Advancement of Women conducted a survey among 3,000 women and asked those women what they felt was the most important issue that should be addressed by the women's movement. Keep in mind, this was 1999, the last century. Uh, the women of that survey said that sexual assault and sexual harassment was the number one issue that the women's movement should be addressing. So you see that while the Me Too, we Too movement, or the Me Too movement, uh, has raised a lot of attention to this issue over the past year or so, it's been in the front pages of the newspapers, or the media of, of the past year or so, this has been an issue that has been around for a very, very long time long time. So we are bringing together this afternoon two high visibility experts, Lisa Bloom, attorney who has handled some of the most difficult sexual harassment charge, charges um, and, and is, is presently among the top attorneys in the country around this issue with respect to plaintiffs bringing charges against those who are purported to uh, commit violence against women. Um, and so we'll talk a lot about where we are. Um, um, Marjorie Fisher, who is the head of the program at Columbia University, which came under so much attention for a while ago, will also talk about sexual harassment on campuses. It will be a very, very uh, fiery and spicy conversation, I promise you. Fiery and spicy. So someone's going to have to top fiery and spicy as adjectives for this session. Akshat Rathi is the London-based reporter for Quartz, where he covers science, energy, and environment, and will speak on a panel today on storage, the holy grail for sustainable energy. Akshat. If you think about human development, you would probably put the invention of agriculture as a turning point where humans went from being hunter-gatherers to having organized societies. But I say that agriculture alone wasn't enough. You needed to be able to store the produce to be able to go through seasons and weather patterns that in, in periods when you won't be able to produce that food. And over millennia, we have learned how to harness not just the ability of new materials, but also how to store them. So we started with, with uh, grains, then we moved to livestock, metals, and eventually to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are really stored energy from millions of years ago. The problem is, in the 21st century, we cannot keep using fossil fuels because of one of the greatest challenges of, of the century, climate change. Uh, in this panel, we're going to talk about what are the alternatives to storing energy. Uh, when you think about uh, storing energy, you're probably thinking about the batteries that are running out, don't last a whole day. But batteries are a very small uh, solution to this problem. Um, in the panel, uh, we'll have Jody Simone, uh, uh, whom you've probably heard from, professor of chemistry, uh, serial entrepreneur who runs the company Carbon. Uh, but also has a battery company. We also have a serial entrepreneur in Rob Picconi, who's uh, bringing his company out of stealth mode, so a surprise here at Ken Presents, um, something that Ben Rosen has invested in. Even more reasons why you should join us at 2.15 to learn how to bring sustainable energy to the century. Now that's a tip, a Ben Rosen investment here. I'm going in for that immediately. Uh, Luis Diaz, uh, head of the Division of Solid Tumor Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the great institution which we are all blessed to have in at least our city and in the country. will lead a panel on immunotherapy, 
New Hope for Cancer. Well, thanks for having me. And I, I have a tough subject, oncology, cancer. It's scary. Um, in the past, we haven't known a lot about cancer. And over the past decades, let's say the past 50 years, we've gone from medicine and oncology being really an art form of our ideas as oncologists to a science, where now we know more about oncology and cancer and the cancer itself and the immune system around it, that we've taken that knowledge and started translating that into action. And so what our panel is gonna focus on, and I'm doing it with Harold Varmus and a surprise visitor, is how we've taken that knowledge, and we know more than we've ever known about cancer before, and translated that into action. And our surprise panelist is an example of, in human form, how we've taken all that data, all that information, and married it with the art of medicine and actually had a spectacular result. So I hope you join us, and even if you don't, it's videotaped, right? So thank you so much. <laughs> We love surprises. Not the Trump kind, but uh, Harold McGee, the American author who writes about the chemistry and history of food science and cooking. Is Harold here? All right. Uh, what? Well, come on. Corby. Corby, pinch hitting again. He'll make something up. <laughs> he's, he's incredibly creative. <laughs> so, when Harold, when Harold McGee wrote his book on food and cooking in 1984, as the great and brilliant Charles Mann said yesterday, he invented a genre. How many authors can say they invented a genre? And that is cooking an omelet, boiling a potato, trying desperately to rescue a failed mayonnaise. What is the science behind it? If I understand the science once, will I be able to remember it, to save my mayonnaise, to save my cake batter, to make a good roast chicken, to learn that browning does not uh, searing meat does not keep in the juices. That's one of the great myths he exploded. He changed the field of cooking to make it include science and to make every cook understand that in order to have successful results, it really pays off to understand a little bit of science. And because he's such a good and clear writer, even for those of us who didn't do so well in science in high school and God forbid college, uh, he made it all comprehensible and approachable. And so we're very lucky to have him today. I look forward to talking to him and you. A master of impromptu, that's brilliant. Uh, now, person, man who needs no introduction, uh, the omnipresent Michael Kramer will talk about Russia on top. Good morning, and I think I've just made a command decision about our panel. We're gonna dissolve and offer just 50 minutes of Corby talking about whatever he wants to talk about. <laughs> it could not be worse. Um, what the hell is up with Russia? Who knows? Um, we're gonna try to get to the bottom of some of that. Uh, <clears throat> to the bromance between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump to trying to understand why the Russians seem to be, why Moscow seems to be so successful in splitting the West at this point. Whether there's something innate in the Russian character that pines for authoritarianism. These kinds of questions and more uh, will be addressed by our panel, which will have Nick Burns and Bill Taubman. Nick, you've been to Kent uh, several times in the past. He's been an ambassador uh, to almost as many countries as Chris Hill, and that's not easy. And he was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Uh, Bill Taubman is probably the most pre the preeminent historian of modern Russia in the country at this point. His 
book on Khrushchev, won the Pulitzer Prize. His latest book on Gorbachev, called Gorbachev, on sale outside is a masterpiece that really helps explain these questions of the character of Russia, how Gorbachev was able to engineer or preside over the collapse of the Soviet Union, and what's happened since as we kind of revert to a strong man. Um, 410 this afternoon in Madison, uh, you will come away smarter. Thanks. <laughs>
offensive and antithetical to American values and to the history of the city he loves, New Orleans. You'll also hear about the people who inspired him, the people who had a great role in shaping his character and encouraging him to be creative and to follow his dreams and to come to New York and establish a new center, a new institute at Lincoln Center. You'll also get to hear Winton play. So we look forward to seeing you at 510 in this room. Thank you. Let me, let me close with, uh, with just two quick notes. One, uh, my, my uh, persistent pitches about buying books is serious. Um, in an era, Trump age era of no truth, there is truth, but there are also wonderful people who write fascinating intellectual things. And those of us here, uh, a way to pay tribute, show respect, and appreciation for the people who have spoken here is to carry their books under your, their, your arm, whether you read them or not, and take them home, hopefully read them. So I'm urging you in the most serious way, please go buy their books, buy them all. Uh, they deserve it, and it's an important mark of our society and civilization that some of us still buy and read books. Uh, second, uh, uh, at this time, which is sort of the last time we convene in this kind of session, let's all pay tribute again to the extraordinary Ben and Donna Rosen for what they've given us. Donna is still cooking lunch, so where is she? Donna, where are you? Donna, stand. Donna, stand up, Donna. Nine twenty-five. We start uh, promptly at nine twenty-five, so you have nine minutes to buy books. I expect a big rush there. Thank you all. <laughs>